Good afternoon, everybody. I'll just allow a little bit of a moment for people to file into the Zoom room as is customary. But um, I'll begin. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International European Affairs in Dublin. It's uh, absolutely a great pleasure to welcome you to today's event on this important topic, um, where we're, we're going to be um, hearing from Hirtian Koopman, who's the Director General at the Director General for Neighbourhood and Enlargement uh, Negotiations, DG Near, in the European Commission. The event will follow the same format as is conventional. I'll just have the pleasure in a moment of introducing the speaker a little more formally uh, to tell us exactly who he is. But it's just worth noting today, obviously, is a, is a big day in Ireland. I, like many others, I'm in my home place to cast my vote as our general election will take place. Uh, unlike most European countries, we do it rather quickly. So we've had a three-week campaign, and we should have a sense of uh, how things are looking over the coming days. But for that for that reason, it's an exciting time to be involved or talking in, um, in, in this format. And secondly, as well, this week, we also marked a very important moment where the European Commission, the College of Commissioners under President von der Leyen, was, was, uh, was invested in Brussels, in Strasbourg, excuse me, where the, where the vote took place. So for both of those... Um, entities for the Irish Republic and indeed for, for the European Union. Enlargement is an extremely important topic. Ireland, arguably one of the one of the great success stories of enlargement, a country that arrived in in the first enlargement round in 1973 and the country has been transformed economically and socially ever since, uh, partly because, largely because, associated with Ireland's EU membership. So looking forward to uh, the discussion with you here, Tian. I'm merely going to introduce you now and hand over to you. Here, Tian Koopman is the Director General of DG NEAR since January 2023. In this role, Mr. Koopman oversees the EU's neighbourhood and enlargement negotiations, supporting countries in the southern and eastern neighbourhood and promoting EU values in the region. Previously, Here, Tian was Director General of the European Commission's Budget Department from 2018 to 2023. In this role, he contributed to putting in place the European Union's 800 billion next generation EU recovery plan, a game changer amidst the COVID pandemic as well as the 18 billion macro financial assistance for Ukraine following Russia's invasion, full-scale invasion of that country. Before that, Mr. Koopman was Deputy D Director General in DG Comp, competition responsible for state aid control. He joined the European Commission in 1991 as an administrator in the Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs, and Mr. Koopman graduated with degrees in economics and classics from the University of Amsterdam. I also believe uh, this isn't the first time you've spoken with us, here, Tian, the last time it was in person, and it was in Dublin. So it's really nice to reconnect with you, albeit digitally this time. I'm going to ha hand over to you now. Our expectations, you'll have 15, 20 minutes or so to regale us with an address, and then we'll move straight to a quick discussion with myself and a QA. and a As ever, this discussion, for those joining us online, is on the record. You can participate in the discussion using the Twitter X handle, at IIEA. And if you have questions, please do insert them into the Q&A function on Zoom. That's it for me here, Tian. A very sincere welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, very good to be back, uh, even if it's virtually. I would have much preferred to be in Dublin, uh, and I uh, will always also be looking uh, very, uh, very carefully at the results of your elections uh, this evening. Uh, I think uh, doing this in just three weeks uh, clearly is uh, is a best practice, which we should be looking at more widely across the EU. Now um, the. The topic for my my talk today is is indeed very important. Uh, enlargement, as uh, reflected in the enlargement package adopted in October uh, uh, of this year, on the 30th of October, is is right at the top of the policy agenda and has been there since the brutal invasion uh, of Ukraine by by Russia. Um, and in fact, it has. Uh, gained momentum over these past few years in a way that very few people could have imagined uh, just uh, at the start of the previous mandate. We, we are now transitioning into a new mandate on the 1st of December. A new set of commissioners will be taking over and we had the farewell party of our outgoing commissioner who, who recalled how when he was given the portfolio uh, back in 2019, it was seen as an area where probably very little was going to happen. But the world has changed dramatically, and let me just illustrate that. Back in 2019, we were uh, looking at seven partners who, who were relevant for enlargement, who, who wanted to, to join us, um, and there are 10 today. Uh, more importantly, I think, 
back in the day, we had five candidate countries who we had officially granted candidates, <coughs> apologies, candidate status to. Um, today, that's nine, so, so nearly doubled. And more impressively, uh, back in 2019, we were negotiating. So we had opened negotiations with three countries. Today, we're negotiating with seven countries. So, you know, just looking at it factually, statistically, clearly there is momentum. But I think there's something else that has changed. And that is that whilst enlargement uh, was, was seen very much as something we were doing for the candidate countries, um, I think today we see enlargement as a political initiative that is of geostrategic importance also for the EU. So in that sense, it's become more symmetric, uh, I, I, I believe. And I often think that um, enlargement in a way leverages the economic superpower of the European Union because it brings countries into the world's largest internal market. Uh, and it has this economic and social transformative effect, which you refer to, Barry, for, for Ireland, but it's it's true for the Baltics, it's true for Poland, it's true for, frankly, many uh, uh, new new member states as, as the Union expands. Of course, you know, accession is much more than a social economic development. We need to be very clear about that. It also means that the countries um, internalize fully and sign up to the European values set out in Article 2 of the treaty. Um, and share um, an economic, social, and political space that uh, uh, has a, a huge impact on, on the countries themselves. Interestingly, the Union itself is also transformed by enlargement. Uh, and, and I think the EU, as it is today, feels and looks rather different to the EU, which you refer to, I joined back in 1991. So it's a very dynamic process. I think there is no historic precedent uh, for it. Economically, beyond any doubt, um, a massive success. Anyone who wants to see that should just walk the streets of Dublin, or more, more, you know, for a more recent example, go to Vilnius, go to Warsaw. These these countries just look completely different, um, and uh, uh, you will also find the greatest protagonists of enlargement in the new member states, because people have the the real life experience and still sense it. Uh, which in, in some of the older member states has has maybe not uh, uh, been uh, so, so visible uh, in the recent past. Now, let me talk a little bit about the enlargement process. Uh, I, I'm sorry to use the word process. I, I promised myself not to use it, but there I go. Um, it, it is very firmly merit-based, and, and it depends on objective progress achieved by our partner countries based anchored on the Copenhagen uh, criteria and the reforms that are needed to internalize all areas of EU law. At the heart, since the new enlargement methodology, are the so-called fundamentals, the rule of law, justice system, which you know are foundational for any state um, and are fundamental. So they remain the cornerstones of the enlargement process. And we, we actually open negotiations nowadays by opening the, the, the fundamentals cluster, as we say, we group these areas in clusters. Um, and we only close it as the last cluster. So it, it very clearly circumscribes uh, the whole uh, process. I already referred to values. You know, the promotion of EU values is essential. And therefore, especially in these very troubled times, alignment with the EU's common foreign and security policy is is a more important signal than it is than it has ever been. I talked a bit about economics already, and uh, you know, if you look at uh, where the Baltics are today, and where they were in uh, 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 at the time of the large great enlargement, now twenty years ago, they nearly doubled their GDP per capita, so their income per head of the population. And today, looking at the Western Balkans, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine we see that their uh, uh, GDP per capita is well below 50% of that of the EU. The Western Balkans, it stands at about 35%. Uh, obviously, Ukraine is very poor. And you know that clearly signals that we are looking at a very big challenge. 
which is why, and this is new, uh, uh, we have put the emphasis much more squarely on progressive or gradual integration, whereby we try to front load reforms, uh, so obligations, if you will, but match that with benefits by giving new countries, partner countries, access to the internal market on the condition that they undertake the necessary uh, reforms, thereby speeding up the process of uh, convergence and allowing the countries to prepare themselves better. Um, it's, it's very important economically because it closes the convergence gap and therefore makes enlargement much easier. But it's also important from a political economy point of view, and I want to labor that point a little bit. Um, you know, when you joined, enlargement was a, a process where, yes, you needed to put the acquis on the statute books, and that took a bit of time, but, but the acquis was relatively small. The acquis, in other words, the corpus of EU legislation nowadays is, is certainly twice as large. If you count it by the number of pages it covers in the uh, official journal, very crude metric, but still, as it was 20 years ago. So enlargement is a bigger task now than it was back then. Also because the union is much more active in uh, uh, various uh, uh, parts of our uh, economic and political ecosystems than it was back then. The traditional way of doing enlargement where, you know, the reforms which carry a political cost obviously precede the benefits which, which flow flow after enlargement actually happens, therefore becomes more challenging. Um, and the logic of progressive or gradual integration is to better align in time to synchronize, if you will, these costs and benefits, thereby motivating the countries, the partner countries, and at the same time also making enlargement for the existing uh, uh, EU27 easier. Um, so we've moved uh, a lot in, in, in this regard and rolled out economic growth plans for the Western Balkans, which uh, uh, have started uh, uh, delivering now, uh, for Ukraine through the Ukraine uh, facility. And recently we have proposed a similar plan for Moldova, all based on the logic of linking uh, reforms to uh, support uh, for uh, investments uh, and, and, and the budget, very much anchored on the logic of Next Generation EU, this big reform program you just referred to, which we set up for our own member states in the wake of the uh, uh, COVID crisis. I, I, I'll, I'll just quickly run through a few important points here uh, to, to give you a sense of what happened in 2024, because that is really what uh, our enlargement package sets out in a bit more detail. But before I do that, I want to make one further observation, which is that in the past months, what we have seen is a dramatic change in the countries themselves, because on the back of this progressive integration, the geopolitical environment, and frankly, the acceleration in reform pace, we see that partner countries are beginning to set ambitious targets for completing the negotiations themselves. Uh, Montenegro has set itself a target of closing the accession negotiations by the end of 2026. Albania, uh, which has just started the negotiations, frankly, set itself the target of doing that by the end of 27. And Serbia uh, uh, has very recently set itself the target of doing that by the end of 26. And others are looking at the same question in a lot of detail. I think we should not underestimate the importance of this development. This is not, let me be very clear, the union setting a date for accession. No, this is the partner countries setting their own target to be ready. And I must say, of course, we have worked with these countries to help them formulate these targets in a realistic but ambitious manner. And we believe that these targets are stretched, certainly, but they are realistic. We haven't seen that in a very, very long time. Uh, we haven't seen that, frankly, since Croatia joined the EU back in 2013. So, so there is also momentum qualitatively in terms of how the countries approach this. And having a target comes with a planning. What needs to be done? When? In order to get there. And I, I'm not going to go into the techni technicity of the enlargement process, but you know there are interim steps that have to be taken before you can move forward. So, so from this target, you, you then derive a planning, which means also that there is an accountability device for your government, 
for the ministries and a monitoring device so that we can actually check uh, whether you're on track or not on track. And we can also plan the work in the council and our technical assistance in function of this planning. So this, I think, is, is actually really a very big change indeed. As I've said, Montenegro um, set itself this target and we are now in the business after passing this closure of the interim benchmarks. Uh, we're on a, a, a track to start provisionally closing chapters. We are aiming at closing four chapters next month. Um, in the previous mandate, five chapters in total were closed across all negotiating partners. So this is actually huge. Um, I should also note, coming back to the theme of progressive integration, that uh, earlier this month, actually last week, Montenegro and Albania became the first ever um, enlargement partners to join the single euro payment area, um, which is an area within which you can transfer money very speedily and without cost, saving uh, these countries anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of uh, uh, of the value of transactions in, in transaction cost. Uh, hugely important, therefore, for citizens and for uh, businesses. I mean, for citizens, this is comparable in some ways to visa-free travel. We know that Serbia and uh, North Macedonia uh, are uh, very hot on the heels of these two and probably likely to get there as well uh, early next year. So Montenegro definitely is on a roll. It's closing chapters, it's joining SEPA, it set itself the target for the end of 26. And as I said, I've deemed that uh, realistic. Albania, after opening cluster one, uh, um, it, it is aiming at uh, opening cluster six later this month, which is the external uh, affairs cluster. Also very realistic, council has started the preparations. And that therefore means that a country that has just started on its track is already, would already by the end of this year have opened two of the six clusters. Uh, Serbia has had a very uh, uh, slow pace of reforms over a long period of time, but as I said, now seems to have begun turning the corner, and we are working very hard with the presidency to open cluster three on competitiveness. Um, and uh, uh, we believe that uh, this could open the door for a very different trajectory for Serbia, and given that it's the largest economy in, in, in the Western Balkans, given its, its, its historical ties with Russia, uh, I, I also think this is a monumental uh, 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 development. North Macedonia needs to still meet the conditions set by the um, uh, Council, uh, namely uh, to introduce constitutional amendments, recognizing the right of uh, minorities in order to be able to move forward with the opening of its first cluster. It used to be uh, uh, running in parallel with Albania. It's now accumulated a little bit of a backlog, but I'm optimistic that the country will find a way forward and hopefully, possibly rejoin Albania on what is a very fast uh, track. Um, Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is arguably the most complicated country in the region, we all know this, um, you know, uh, after very, very difficult, after a very, very difficult period, actually started making reforms and the council uh, decided uh, back in uh, uh, 22 to open negotiations, accession negotiations, that was actually uh, confirmed earlier this year, and we are now uh, uh, looking forward to to a number of steps which the country needs to take before the negotiating framework can be adopted. Um, and and therefore, whilst this is a very complicated country, it had elections as a result of which the momentum that prevailed until March uh, uh, was was slowed down. We 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 remain optimistic uh, uh, that it will also uh, advance. Kosovo, the, the sixth uh, of the uh, Western Balkan partners, has applied for membership, applied for membership back in 2022. Um, uh, here, uh, progress is slow. Council needs to invite the Commission to, uh, to, to assess its uh, membership application. Uh, recently, uh, both between uh, Serbia and uh, uh, Kosovo, the, the progress of normalization between the two partners uh, through the Pristina Belgrade dialogue has not has not advanced very well and and Kosovo is also is also holding elections on the 9th of February uh, next year and I, I think that's that's also a, a factor that that plays a certain role in the extent to which they are uh, uh, aligning um, now 
Turkey is a candidate country. It's a key partner. Uh, but as you know, since 2018, the accession negotiations are at a standstill because they uh, um, are, are, are essentially uh, uh, blocked on account of backsliding in, in several key areas, uh, notably the fundamentals. But we're re-engaging re in a more transactional approach where uh, our, our strong economic uh, ties, after all, we share a customs union with Turkey, um, and economic and political ties and, and security interests are, are, are looked at uh, fully uh, taking account of the need to make progress on the Cyprus uh, challenge, uh, the Cyprus problem. And, and this progress, progressive, proportionate and reversible work we're doing is beginning uh, to bear fruit. Uh, I would, for example, expect uh, the EIB to be re-engaging in uh, Turkey. Uh, uh, we actually have a mandate to, to work with them to do that. I would also expect uh, that um, the good work that is being undertaken in terms of uh, uh, trade irritants uh, and sanction, uh, anti, you know, sanction circumvention, anti-sanction -san circumvention, I should say, that this will lead to a further momentum. Turning to the East, uh, of course, the opening of the accession negotiations with, with Ukraine and Moldova, for, for the reasons that I highlighted right at the start of my talk, was absolutely monumental. Opened the negotiations in June further to just after uh, they were declared candidate countries in the summer of 22. So breakneck speed, um, serious reform efforts, despite impossible, uh, an impossibly difficult situation in, 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 in Ukraine. But I want to underline that uh, this was earned uh, on merit, and that the opening uh, 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 is is therefore fully justified. In other words, let me be very clear: the merit-based principle is not, I repeat, not being sacrificed on the altar of geostrategic and geopolitical interests. In fact, what we have seen is that uh, the country, and I would say also the the EU system, has worked extremely hard to do both at the same time. Moldova is also moving forward. Both countries benefit, as I said, from growth plans, Ukraine through a 50 billion euros Ukraine facility running until the end of 27, and Moldova will, will hopefully very soon benefit from its own uh, reform and growth facility, which we hope will enter into force uh, soonest. Now, the third country in the East, uh, Georgia, was granted candidate status uh, uh, last year, but unfortunately, uh, seems to have lost its way, let me use this uh, uh, form of words, uh, in that uh, um, after the passing of a number of very problematic laws, including a foreign agents law, the, the council decided to uh, suspend negotiations. And just recently, uh, 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 in fact, yesterday, the prime minister of the country announced that he wanted to, uh, he wants to uh, suspend uh, uh, Georgia's work on, on the EU path until 28. There are many issues here also in terms of the quality of the elections. Uh, uh, the country's population is staunchly pro-European, 80 to 90 percent. Stopping uh, uh, the EU uh, track until 28 seems uh, to go right against uh, what the uh, vast majority of Georgians want. So we will need to look at how we uh, uh, address this issue. Um, it's clearly uh, uh, a disappointing uh, development. Now, let me be clear, I, I don't want to speculate about whether these ambitious targets uh, uh, and, and the developments in the East, uh, uh, which are so positive in Ukraine and Moldova in terms of the enlargement track, will lead to enlargement in, in, in the next mandate. But what I can say is that the momentum uh, uh, is actually translating into real action on the ground. And that uh, technically, uh, uh, this process of gradual integration, accelerating accession negotiations, economic reforms, uh, rising uh, living standards, uh, ties us up for, for a path that looks very similar uh, to the path that uh, the generation of 2004 uh, member states were on just before uh, an enlargement. So uh, clearly uh, for the incoming commission, this will be a a massively uh, 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 significant challenge. Now, in closing, I want to just pause for a second on what it means for the EU27, because taking in new member states, of course, is uh, something we haven't done for uh, uh, over a decade now. We've, we've signaled that reforms are uh, needed in any event in a number of areas, and we are screening 
uh, uh, the EU's uh, policy areas for for what enlargement might mean. Um, but we're not saying that the potentially additional reforms that would be desirable are a necessary condition for enlargement. I see the two as very much going hand in hand dynamically as they always do. Um, and finally, um, I would also like to underline that enlargement ultimately is something that's decided by the peoples uh, of, our, of our countries. And we know that it's quite likely that people will be asked to express themselves, possibly through a referendum. So a huge challenge for the incoming commission, for the partner countries and the EU27 is actually to organize genuinely intensive and open debates about enlargement in our uh, uh, member states. Uh, I'm not talking about lecturing. I'm not talking about communicating the benefits of enlargement and repeating it if people don't get the message. I'm talking about genuine debate to make sure that the benefits of enlargement, which you refer to at the start of this uh, talk and, and which I refer to, uh, are actually uh, uh, fully taken into account, as are the challenges that no doubt will uh, uh, arise as we move forward. So a very full agenda going into this new mandate. A lot to play for, as they say, um, in, uh, uh, in, in a number of sports. Uh, and uh, all of that in a context that has radically changed where Frankly, the security of the EU and the geostrategic context are completely new dimensions uh, that we are uh, addressing uh, 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 very, very fully. Many thanks. Gerd Jan, thank you very much. Uh, I have to say it was it was a pleasure hearing you and and sensing the optimism that you still have for, for this process. If I can, if I can put it that way, and also just generally, what came through is your remarkable history with the institutions if you've been there since 1991 the amount of transformative change you've seen that's pre maastricht i guess so, i mean the just the kind of uh, rate pace and depth of change you must have observed really came across in your remarks and and it's very clear uh, as you depict enlargement is a geostrategic it's of geostrategic significance um it's had a, a transformative impact on member states of course when i mentioned ireland i wasn't saying only ireland but on every member state i would argue it's had a largely positive if not entirely positive impact but we do get a sense from your remarks that the, the, the stakes are really high needless to say not just because of the war in ukraine but i would argue the stakes have always been high you know back to the very start the, the second world war the fall of the, of the dictators in the 70s and 80s the collapse of the ussr leadership was always found to bring the enlargement process forward and indeed an integration forward and i can just hope as a citizen as a european that it'll be found again the one the final thought i'm having before we move to the questions of which there are plenty i've loads myself but you can see the little red button um you're down you've you've uh, elicited many thoughts from the from those who are watching Pat Cox, who's a former president of the European Parliament and he's a member of our board and, and an active member of our of our institute, I'm delighted to say, uh, he is very well known to Ukraine and Ukraine is known to him. And he often reminds us that Ukraine is large, it is agricultural and it is poor. And based on what you were saying about uh, the proportion of GDP, um, Ukraine compared to, to the EU, another country joined in the 1970s that was small, agricultural and poor. And it was also 50% of the EEC's GDP at the time. So it isn't just about leadership, obviously. I mean, size matters when we're talking about enlargement. But I just think that's an important footnote from the other edge of Europe to Ukraine, that Ireland came in in, in somewhat similar circumstances. I'm going to put one or two um, questions to you before dipping into the Q&A. First of all, it's a predictable one to an Irish audience. Do you think enlargement can happen um, on the scale that you've depicted without treaty reform? It's a very good question. It's uh, hotly debated. I, I personally think that the answer is yes. Um, but it's definitely also true that it would be easier if we uh, uh, reform the treaties in some respects. However, you know, there is a sometimes undue pessimism about what we can do with the treaties uh, as they stand today. Uh, and there's an undue pessimism, generally speaking, I think, about European decision making. Uh, let me refer to the uh, uh, debates that took place about financing Ukraine over the past year and contrast the European experience with the US experience. The US has a very streamlined <laughs> decision-making process. It's a very polarized political system. 
we have a very complicated system, 27 member states, unanimity requirements in certain areas. But let us also uh, 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 remind ourselves of a very important fact, namely that European support of Ukraine, despite the, the challenges we have in terms of our, our decision-making processes, uh, was never interrupted. Mm. The U.S. actually, unfortunately, saw a very long period uh, earlier this year where, where support was halted. So, you know, we, we, we tend to work uh, very well with uh, the, 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 the challenges we have. It's not optimal, but I, you know, I, I'm a Dutchman. I, 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 we, we're, in my country, we're living a very complicated uh, political landscape today, a government that is unique in terms of uh, its uh, uh, non-parliamentary uh, 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 anchor um, in, in, in terms of its ministers, and it is also functioning. So, you know, we, we, we shouldn't compare uh, uh, our, our, our ideas of what is an optimal, optimal governance system with, with reality and then say that if there's a delta, uh, uh, you know, there is a massive problem. Also, you know, there are possibilities within the existing treaties to, to move towards more QMV because that's ultimately the underlying, uh, the underlying uh, uh, issue. And finally, if I look at the enlargement process itself, we could we could do a lot uh, of things more efficiently, I believe, uh, without actually changing any of the decision making rules. And frankly speaking, that's what we have been uh, doing. I think the process needs to be faster. It's become quite complicated. There are many, many intermediary steps, not all of which are necessary. So for all those reasons, uh, I, 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 I am optimistic that this can be done without treaty change. But it's clear if we if we could change the treaties. And, and as not uh, as above my pay grade to uh, to speculate on that, then 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 that would even be uh, even be speedier. An Irish audience is is very sensitive to these discussions. My kind of uh, first political experiences that I can remember <laughs> were uh, EU treaties that that passed yeah, yeah. didn't pass then passed in in in, in recent Irish history. I've uh, one more short question, and then I'm conscious there is this great activity from the uh, audience, which I appreciate, and I'll. Uh, start dipping into those questions in a moment. It's a simple question, but it invites an entirely different webinar just around the topic of competitiveness. Competitiveness today, for me, as a European studies researcher, is the strategic autonomy of two years ago in that any forum, any any meeting, any discussion tends to revolve back to competitiveness and its importance, obviously derived from the excellent work of Mario Draghi in his recent report. You hinted at this in your remarks, but... Can you say whether there is a is there an obvious trade off between Europe being as competitive as it can be as it currently stands and enlargement, or can the two go hand in hand? Actually, I think enlargement could contribute significantly uh, to competitiveness, and in fact, that's what it did <laughs> back in two thousand four. You know what happened back in two thousand four is that European industry availed itself of a much larger internal market and production locations that were much more cost effective, um, gaining competitive strength uh, 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 in the process. The Czech Republic was transformed into the heart of Autoland in Europe, you know, yeah. car manufacturing took off big time uh, for obvious reasons. Unit labor costs were much lower. Uh, uh, the location uh, uh, to uh, the, the, the geographical distance to markets was, was quite small. Uh, and the EU had invested massively in transport infrastructures. So, um, um, you know, the, the, the cost to market was also quite low. Mm. Uh, so, you know, having a bigger internal market, having lower cost production sites uh, is, is definitely good for enlargement. And I think we should look at Ukraine, not today, not tomorrow, but in the long run, strategically, as a massive strength for the EU. Um, it's got an agricultural sector, I'm sure we'll come, come to that in the discussions, that is a powerhouse. It's got uh, gas storages, uh, which will be a powerhouse. It's got space. Uh, it's got critical raw materials. It's got a big population that is actually relatively well-educated, is young, is growing. Uh, so, you know, we, we need to, to see <laughs> these countries not just for what they are today, but for what they are likely to be if the EU uh, transformative enlargement process does what it always does, namely to boost them. Uh, and that, I think, is really important. So the, the benefits for, for our uh, uh, business uh, uh, environment, for uh, European industry, of a well-designed enlargement process can be very significant indeed. And that's, that's one of the critical arguments we need to have in, in our member states, in the EU27, uh, uh, when we debate enlargement.
Indeed. And indeed, the um, I, I listen carefully to the discussions around food security and other things as well, and Ukraine being such a productive agricultural place, it can contribute to our food security. Um, and I also hope after going to the questions now, but lessons will have been learned from the post-2004 enlargement in terms of social dumping, and there's um, obviously important legislation posting workers' directive and various associated things to prevent yeah. the exploitation of those uh, kind of uh, economic efficiencies that can be found by uh, by enlargement. I'm going to go to the questions now. I should say as well, I just note from those who are in attendance, hello everybody, I note many people from our foreign ministry. I should have noted, of course, I was just in a rush getting off my bike starting this event, that uh, this event is part of our Future Proofing Europe series. It's the ninth event this year, just to thank the DFA, the Department of Foreign Affairs, for sponsoring this, this work and I look forward to many uh, future excellent engagements such as this one. The first question I'm going to put to you, Geert Jan, is from Theresa Riley. How are you, Theresa? Theresa says, in the context of the unfolding situation in Georgia, which you mentioned, and the announcement by the ruling party that that country will halt its EU bid and the ensuing protests and unrest, which you have mentioned, uh, there's a sense that Georgia is missing a unique window of opportunity to join the enlargement wave. Is there still time for Georgia to turn things around? If so, what would the next steps be? Now, you mentioned this, but you have anything to say about whether it's possible for them to turn things around? It's a very good question. Um, personally, I'm very sad that uh, the government made this announcement. It, it's ultimately uh, something which seems to be uh, completely antithetical to what the population wants. Um, can it still be turned around? I think it can be turned around. I'm not sure that this is what uh, uh, is going to happen uh, over the next year or so. Um, I know that in the uh, Georgian system, there is a lot of discussion. Actually, we've seen uh, many diplomats uh, posting uh, on the social media uh, very strong messages that they disagree with this. Uh, it seems to be an announcement by the prime minister. Maybe it could be uh, uh, discussed uh, if, if, if they so, so wish. Uh, uh, and, and we have to see how this is formalized, if it is formalized. So um, my, my own take on this is that it's very clear what the Georgian government needs to do. There are two laws which we have been very clear about are not compatible with the EU path. One relates to foreign agents uh, and the other uh, uh, relates to uh, uh, what, what is called uh, uh, values. Uh, it's essentially an anti-LGBTIQ law. Both laws as they stand today are not compatible with the EU path. And, and I, I think these laws should go. <laughs> uh, then there's the nine steps which are preconditions actually for for moving forward uh, on the enlargement uh, path, which Georgia has 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 has, has, has backpedaled on, and, and needs to re-engage. And if, if Georgia is, is 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 ready to get rid of those two laws, and you know they got rid of the foreign agent law, let let us not forget back in 2023, uh, uh, before putting it back on the statute books this year, then I see no reason why we couldn't re-engage with them. It's a choice ultimately for for Georgia. Um, uh, and it seems to be the clear wish of the Georgian people to move forward on this. So, you know, I, I think it's a it's a surprising announcement. Uh, doesn't really fit with anything the government has said in the past. Doesn't fit with what the people seem to want. So, so let us see how this plays out. Thanks very much, Hirtian. I note a question here about a country that came up in your remarks, but I think a lot of people are spending time thinking about Serbia. And uh, Toby Vogel, great to have you here, Toby. It's been a while. He's at the Dem Democratization Policy Council in Brussels. And I'm sure Toby's known to you, a well-known expert on the region and on, and on the subject. Uh, Toby says, I'll read at length, the 2024 report on Serbia noted backsliding, no progress or very limited progress on a number of issues. The country's foreign policy alignment has further decreased. Elections are marred by serious ir irregularities. And the dialogue with Kosovo, which you mentioned, has failed to produce any progress. Question, on what basis do you believe that Serbia's 2026 goal is realistic in the light of all this? Also, given that Serbia would have to normalize relations with Kosovo and impose sanctions against the Kremlin before it can do so. Well, absolutely. I mean, clearly, you know, Serbia is coming from a position which uh, uh, is not compatible with very fast accession. That is, that is absolutely clear. Serbia also has a, a traditional cultural link to the Slavic world and to Russia, that is a bit different from, from some of the other partners. Um, but what gives me reason for optimism is that uh, since, you know, this new momentum has really taken hold, uh, I have detected uh, a very significant shift in the uh, 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 discussions in Belgrade 
and not just in the discussions, but also in the actions. Uh, it's tricky if you find yourself in this position as uh, Serbia to evolve your position uh, because you don't start from the same position as some of the other partner countries. But it's interesting to note, uh, for example, that Serbia has made three you know, non-enlargement rate related choices that are actually quite important geostrategically. One is that they've made available more ammunition to Ukraine than any other Western Balkans partner, and frankly, than any many of our member states, even some very big member states. That is not nothing, if you think about it. Secondly, a very significant lithium mine, uh, which was clearly targeted by the Chinese and the Americans, because, you know, this is essential for batteries production, um, you know, was given in concession to uh, essentially a European consortium. Uh, so so that, that wasn't evident, to put it mildly. And um, thirdly, uh, the country militarily, in terms of where it puts its resources, uh, has, has made some very significant purchases of uh, Mirage uh, fighter jets in France. Why do I come with these examples? Because they're not directly enlargement related and they're certainly not related to the fundamentals. But they're nevertheless very important. These are not so straightforward. And had you asked anyone on this call two or three years ago whether they would have expected this outcome, I'm sure they wouldn't have. They'll be opening an embassy in, uh, 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 in Ukraine shortly. They've given more aid, you know, grants to, to Ukraine than any other Western Balkan uh, partner. Um, and, you know, following these discussions, I actually myself had meetings with uh, the Serbian government, formulating also the concerns that exist about the key issues which uh, uh, were just mentioned. And, you know, when, when the government then fixed its 26 target, I said, listen, what member states will want to see is action. You know, intentions are good. Action is, is going to be necessary. And since that happened just three weeks ago, Serbia has increased its alignment rate of the CFSP from 51% in the enlargement report to 58%, just in three weeks, 51%, 58%. It has taken commitments uh, with regards to implementing recommendations from ODIR on uh, uh, the election electoral reform that uh, are very far reaching. Actually, a lot of these things are drafted by committees in their parliament involving not just uh, the opposition, but actually CSOs. This was one of the recommendations on the process that they have taken on board. Longstanding concerns about media freedom and uh, media uh, functioning. Uh, necessitating uh, the appointment of an independent independent council supervising this, the so-called REM council. Well, you know, after these discussions, they promised just three weeks ago, finally, to publish a call to set out very clearly the conditions for um, independence uh, of these uh, members and, and for the independence of this board, this REM council. They published it. They said they would publish it uh, Wednesday uh, this week, <laughs> so uh, two days ago, and they published it. And they have announced that they will hold an extraordinary session of parliament. They'll make their parliament come back from its recess in January to appoint these, uh, these people. And finally, they have committed also to um, an audit of the voter lists as part of the action plan uh, uh, to, to tidy that up and the adoption of a number of important media laws that we have validated as conform with the Aki. I'm just giving some very concrete examples to show that, in my view, this is not just about grand announcements. This is actually about taking concrete action and making choices. And I think for, you, you know, the, the country to so publicly now announce the 26th target is a big thing. Yes, there's also ministers traveling to Moscow saying all sorts of things. Huh? That is clear. And, and that is something which over time will have to change. But we should look through some of the uh, couleur locale, if I can use a, uh, uh, um, a, a French term, um, and, and, and remind ourselves of, of where this country was just two, three years ago to see what is actually happening. It's very important. Serbia's role in the Western Balkans is very important. There are Serbs in many, many uh, uh, Western Balkans countries, the biggest oh. economy. So the, you, you know, we all, all also ourselves have a very big interest in uh, in the country uh, moving uh, moving towards Europe, it's really important, uh, and I, I sense uh, uh, on the basis of the examples that I've given that actually something is really changing, and 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 I, I think that 
that, that is not just based on speculation, it's based on, on fact. Thank you for, for that answer and for all the rich context you're able to answer, uh, you're able to provide in, in your answers uh, here, Jan. Conscious of what we said before about your time, that you have a hard finish at uh, at the hour. So just, we have a multitude of questions. If anybody wants to get something in, uh, please try and do so in the next couple of moments. I'll pick one now from Erwan Fahe, if I'm saying your name correct, Erwan, from the Centre for European Policy Studies. It's good to have you with us. Uh, this addresses something that you did speak about in your remarks. So Erwan acknowledges the um, use of veto power by individual member states when it came to accession criteria. He gave the examples of Bulgaria, Macedonia in the past, similarly with Greece and Cyprus. And Erwan asks, are there any moves, you did address this specifically, are there any moves to try and limit the use of veto power and introduce more QMV in the accession process? Sounds tricky. Does the commission intend to develop a comprehensive strategy or mechanism to deal with the many bilateral disputes which exist and which thwart the accession process for kind of non-merit-based reasons? Uh, we, could, we could talk about, this is a very good question. It, it touches on a really important uh, uh, issue, or actually two issues. So we could talk the whole afternoon. I'll just say two things, uh, keeping uh, the time in mind. One, um, on, on the decision-making processes, I think the name of the game is simplification. We tend to set a lot of conditions that are actually ne are, are not needed. So if you don't set these conditions uh, 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 for every step on the road, but you set them where it really matters, you simplify the process and it doesn't actually lead to any changes in QMV. But there's also a, a paper drafted by the Germans and the Slovenians uh, 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 highlighting how for procedural steps you could move to QMV. That's definitely something we need to look at. On the bilateral issues, they are actually really important. We need a framework for this, especially in the Western Balkans, reconciliation has not been achieved. And that's something we need to work on. In the context of uh, the accession process, I find, and let me be a bit critical, that we haven't done enough ourselves. We know these issues are big. We need to work with the countries, and the European Commission should be much more active in brokering agreements and being on the ball. You know, this is not something we can just leave to them. We need to be much more active, and we need to use the the power of the accession process itself to 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 build in. Uh, 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 these uh, these elements. And that's also very true for Pristina Belgrade. We have a dialogue that's been going nowhere for a long time, unfortunately. But if we have an accession process with Serbia and hopefully later with Kosovo, then actually this should be part of the accession process. We have our own responsibility. So I see plenty of opportunities of addressing these issues. And it would be remiss of me not to say that I, I obviously have colleagues in both in both places and, and I very often speak about by both places I mean Pristina and Belgrade and I often speak about the Irish experience as parochial as it is uh, so every conflict is utterly different but it is well documented and just a, a known truth that shared EU membership fed into the habits of cooperation which brought about ultimately peace in Northern Ireland and I think exactly. it's important to remember the role that the kind of familiarisation um, especially at the official level played in that we'll have time for Two, three more questions, if I'm quick. The next question I'll give to you, uh, Pert Jan, comes from Brigadier General Jer Hearn. Great to have you with us, Jer. Uh, Jer is a member of the Institute. And he says, are the delays of countries in Southeastern Europe being allowed, the delays for countries in Southeastern Europe uh, in terms of their joining the EU, is that driving those countries incrementally into the arms and influence of Russia and China? Another big question. Yeah. So, so this is why you know the new momentum is so important. I think if we if we get this wrong, uh, then I fear that may exactly be what will happen. And let us not be naive. Uh, I think Russia, China, and and to some extent uh, other actors in the region may have a strong interest in in, in those outcomes. So that's why I'm saying you know, accession. The accession process is also in our interest. The countries need to do hard reforms, but we also need to work harder. And we need to make it easier where we can without cutting any corners. Don't get me wrong. Uh, so, so you know, if we if if, if we bungle this, uh, uh, we will also pay a price. And uh, certainly on my watch, that is not what I want, want to want, want to happen. Thank right you. Here. A question from Lucas Schaefer, who is from Schumann Associates. Good to have you with us, Lucas. Um, ultimately, he his question concerns the relations between the enlargement package and the reform and growth facility. In your view, Kertian, are there synergies between these two frameworks and how can countries benefit the most of both facilities, the reform and growth facility and the enlargement package? Yeah. No, so in the in, in, in the growth in the reform and growth facility, we have actually included a number of the really hard accession reforms. 
And the beauty of this instrument, as, as I was saying earlier, is that it's based on conditionality, hard conditionality. So you've got to do the reforms to get the money. So some of the hardest stuff we've put in the in, in, in the reform and growth facility, uh, uh, which which means it, it the reform and growth facility itself is not just a socio-economic tool, uh, but it will turbocharge, uh, uh, so to speak, the the accession process. So that's the link. And conversely, you know, once then the accession process starts moving faster, expectations of citizens and investors will also start changing, and that will make it easier for them to make more investments in the region. So you get this virtuous circle as a result of the two uh, processes working in tandem. Fantastic. We're going to have time, I think, uh, Hertian. I'm going to give you two questions together now, and then I have a concluding question, and this should, should, should see us finish before the hour, so you can make your next appointment. These two questions come from uh, one of the great an example, a great success story of European integration itself. So it's an Irish student after his undergraduate in Ireland, I know, to be studying in, in the great university in Leiden in your home country. And it's Greg Arrowsmith. Good to have you with us, Greg. Greg asked one question, which you kind of addressed, but I still would like to put it to you. He says, are you open or would you have a view on uh, a Cyprus style accession for candidates such as Moldova, Serbia and Ukraine, places where there are frozen conflicts? Is there a is it a red line issue for the EU that all frozen territorial disputes are fully resolved before membership is granted, regardless of progress with the rest of the EU? So that's one. It might invite just a short answer because you've kind of addressed it. And the second one from Greg, it's a good question. It's quite broad. What would you say are the, are the lessons the EU might or should learn from the lack of progress and accession from 2013 to 2022? How would you respond to the theory that EU accession fatigue has reduced the credibility of the EU's promise of accession? Yeah, two very good questions. I think the answer to the first question is no, uh, but obviously, you know, we do need to find a framework to to manage it. And, you know, Cyprus is one thing, Ukraine is another thing, so it will require a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. Uh, but uh, you refer to the Irish experience in terms of, of, of building peace. I remember some of my predecessors were very involved in that. And if you take Serbia, uh, Kosovo, actually, I think, you know, this is exactly what the EU is. The EU is the world's most effective, most powerful peace process. Uh, I can say that as a Dutchman, uh, uh, you know, from a country that that emerged out of, you know, completely shattered out of the Second World War and now works together very, very closely with Germany. Huh? We tend to forget that we also had our issues in the Balkans. People tend to focus exclusively on their own issues. But Ireland, the Netherlands, a lot of member states had issues, right? And they have all been resolved in part thanks to the EU. Let's not exaggerate. It's not only the EU. So so that 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 that, that is clear. Lessons. Yes, I, I think uh, that, that you know, by, you, you know, the old joke, let me let me tell you the old joke. The old joke was that the countries were pretending uh, to reform and we were pretending to enlarge. And in terms of, you know, buying off, buying off our bad conscience, we gave them quite a lot of money uh, in, in, in the process. I think this is terrible. You know, it has led to, it, it breeds cynicism. It breeds uh, uh, cronyism. It breeds all sorts of problems you don't want, certainly not in the Balkans. And, and I think we have, also a large share of the responsibility to bear for that. I think th that time is completely over now. We're in a very different dynamic in, in, in the Balkans. But, you know, ultimately, it's our member states that need to take the decisions. Huh? I, I always tell my the, the ambassadors here in the choir pair, I'm your chief negotiator, but, you know, you decide what happens, right? Uh, and you can kill a chief negotiator. Uh, and then if you do that too often, uh, maybe you get a new chief negotiator, but then if it happens again, you kill the process. So, so we can't get that wrong again for the reasons we just discussed. It's really important that when we say we want to enlarge the union, when we set criteria and countries meet the criteria, that we then also follow suit. We have to hold our part of the bargain. I think that's absolutely critical. I think so far we are doing that. Uh, you know, if you take Ukraine, that's not easy. Uh, we all know what happened uh, earlier this year, but we have been holding our part of the bargain. We've been good. Uh, uh, you know, we, we've kept kept our word, and I think this is this is this is absolutely critical. And I tell you, I sense that our partners feel that 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 we are serious, and that makes all the difference because it's not easy to 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 reform. It's not easy. You have to take on vested interests. So these governments are, uh, uh, you know, they're facing big big challenges. And why would you undertake those challenges if on the other side of the table uh, you, you've got someone who's not who's not sincere? So so the two things are really very much linked. Thank you. Thank you, Gert-Jan. And I'm going to put 
a final thought to you and you might treat your answer as any concluding remark that you'd like to share that politics at all its levels at the home in the community in the world is is often about trade-offs if you do one thing you can't do another it's about the distribution of scarce resources so in that mindset i try and think of enlargement as i, I try and look at the what is often said are the costs of non-enlargement So enlargement is tricky for the reasons you've outlined, but there are, are huge things at stake if, if we choose not to enlarge or if we end up not enlarging. Could you just maybe share any thoughts you have about what the costs of non-enlargement would be for the EU? For whatever reason, if it doesn't happen, what what would happen to the EU in terms of, of, of good or bad outcomes? And indeed, if you have any concluding remarks or, or, or thoughts. And thanks a million for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Barry. Well, just two thoughts, really. I, I think it's very important, you know, Uh, that we see enlargement not as a zero-sum game. It's a positive-sum game. And, and you know, economic growth is a positive-sum game. We, we in Europe tend to forget that sometimes. So, you know, everyone will be better off if we enlarge, even if there are trade-offs. Yes, there will be trade-offs, but we will have more wealth to distribute to compensate whomever is losing. There might be losers. We need to compensate them. But it's a positive-sum game for the uh, exceeding countries and for the EU27. Um, And my second uh, thought is really that, you know, the alternative, the alternative with regards to Ukraine is something I think anyone who focuses a little bit will not want to contemplate too much because it's an awful picture. You know, a country that, uh, uh, you know, is sitting where it's sitting with more arms than people, devastated economically, uh, fractured uh, socially, with many people who have been you know, traumatized by, by the most brutal war on the European continent since the Second World War, who were promised repeatedly uh, by European leaders that they could join if they made the reforms. And then, you know, in, in this scenario, if they make the reforms, we would be refusing them. It's, a, it's not a pretty picture. It's, 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 it's awful for them, but it's very dangerous for us. So that's something we cannot let happen. Very, very clear uh, point on which to end. And uh, here, Jan, you're, you're going to make your your meeting in a minute. J just to say a real sincere thanks. I enjoy that very much. As I said, your decades of experience uh, and just the clarity with which you, you present your thoughts is, is really marvellous. And just thank you once again for making time for the Institute. I look forward to checking in again in, in due course. I'd like to thank all of you who took the time to join and participate. And just once again to thank the Department of Foreign Affairs for sponsoring this series, Future Proofing Europe and also to Lorcan and Tara from our team for pulling things together. Here, Jan, thank you very much. Have a lovely weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.